So this morning we continue with our series, The Church As, and um, this morning we, we're going to find out and discover that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Now, we have the privilege, um, is, is Shay MacArthur here this morning? Is, is she not here? Okay, so, so Shay, um, who sings on stage and is very much a part of our community, and Daniel, her fiancé, we want to congratulate them because they're going to be getting married now in April, and um, I have the privilege of sharing that day uh, with them, myself and my wife, and, um, and as we are journeying with them um, with premarital counseling, over these four weeks, getting to know them and having an opportunity to speak into their lives and to share with them of what marriage is all about, especially that it's a communion with the Lord and it's a covenant relationship. It has been an amazing time to do that, but it's always a reminder for myself and Terrell that um, that's, it's an expensive uh, thing, you know? Um, and maybe I need to remind my wife, maybe we're in the wrong business, maybe we should do Weddings, uh, you know, and um, and then this morning before I get into the church as the bride, um, l- let's talk about this uh, the day. Let's talk about the day of marriage. Let's talk about the wedding day because um, I think for some of us we've got the wrong concept that all the time and effort and money that's gone into the day, sometimes we forget about the marriage. Um, there's so much stress that comes around it, so. I went onto the internet and I, I wanted to find out, so what, what is the cost of a wedding? Like, you know, what, 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 what is the cost of a wedding? So I found an article um, by Discovery who did um, an, an article and a costing of what a wedding could possibly look like. So what I need uh, from the congregation, I, uh, um, this is the only time that you're allowed to take out your cell phone, okay? Um, so I need somebody to add up the first figures that I give you, and then I need somebody else to add up the second figures that I give you. Is that okay? okay so so let's, let's total this up and see how much does the wedding day cost. Can we do that? Okay, so this is an article from August 2018. We're now in 2024. So... The accountants in the room will add on percentages and all of that. But let's look at this. So the venue are higher. The, the first figure is uh, f- starting at 2,000 Rand, okay? Who's got the second figure? Who's doing the first figure? Somebody? Okay, I've got lots of hands. Who's doing the first figure? Are you doing the first figure? Okay, uh, 2,000 Rand. You got it for venue higher. The second figure, who's in, uh, Roz, thank you. The second figure is 15,000 Rand, okay, for venue higher. Deacons, maybe we should hire the church out. Here's the deacons. Wedding invitations, okay? So this is for um, about 100 guests, okay? Courtney, first figure is 1,500 rand, and it can go up to 4,000 rand. The dress and alterations, because we know that the dress is important, right? 5,000 rand, and it can go up to anything up to 25,000 rand, okay? What about the jewelry and the accessories? 1,500 rand, and the, it goes up to 8,000. That's the second figure. The wedding rings can start at 8,500 rand and go anything up to 55,000 rand. Michael, are you sure you want to get married? Louis and Roland will have to take up another bond in their house. <laughs> um, okay, so the makeup. The makeup. You know, all that polyfiller and the hair and all of that type of thing. The first figure is one five, and the second figure is 5,000 Rand, okay? The groom suit, shoes, and accessories. That's everything in one. It starts at one eight. 50, 1,850, and to the max, 6,000 rand, okay? The bridal party, the bridesmaids, starts at 550 rand and up to 1,500 rand. Okay, so sorry, that's for the bouquets, all right? So the dresses and the shoes starts from 2,5, and the second one is 9,5. 
The groomsman with the suits, shoes, and gifts starts at 1.5, and he can go anything up to 5,500 rand. The wedding cake starts at 1,250 rand, and it can go up to 5,000 rand. Just go to spa and get the milk out, man. The decor, the flowers, the centerpieces, and the entertainment can start at 10,000 rand, and it can go anything up to 60,000 rand, okay? Drinks and catering based on 100 guests. Harold, are you making notes here? Uh, Because this is coming up in April, eh? (laughs) So this is for 100 guests, okay? It can start at 15,000 rand, and can go anything up to 55,000 rand. So wedding favors, like, you know, the little gifts that you put on the table and things like that, for about 100 guests, okay, you can start at 1,000 rand, and then can go anything up to 1,500 rand. The photographer, the photographer, can start <laughs> at 9,500 rand, and can go anything up to 23,500 rand. Just take your cell phone there. <laughs> Just a lope. Okay. Okay, the transport. The transport, okay? Um, you can start at 2,000 Rand and it can end up at 5,000 Rand. The marriage certificate and all the legal fees and that started at 75 Rand and could end up at 1,500 Rand. Okay, let's start with the first total. What's the total? 65,175. Roz? 286,000 rand. Yeah, go to Canada. John, I think we're in the wrong business, but do you want to go into partnership? We'll do weddings. Is that cool? Yeah, that's true. Auntie Leslie, I do marriage counseling on Thursday, okay? (laughs) I won't charge you anything. But think about it in terms of the planning that goes into the wedding day, and it's for memories. And we find that the focus is more on the bride than what the bridegroom um, is. I mean, the focus is on the dress, and the focus is on the makeup, and how beautiful the bride looks because it's her day. Um, I've done a few weddings uh, being in full-time ministry, and, uh, and I know that the, that the bride is the boss. Whatever she says goes. Um, I, I had uh, an opportunity to be the MC of my, of my best friend's wedding, and I knew that the bride, she was the boss. And she's OCD, and she's one, it was files, my goodness. And this is how we needed to go, and I'm the MC. And, and on the day, on the day, I was so freaked out that I was going to mess something up. And... And a few things went wrong. And I went to the bride and I said, okay, this is just, it's, everything's okay. I got it under control. Don't stress. And then she was calm. And she was like, it's fine. That's cool. You know, they're married now and the, the I do's. And this is just before the reception. The reception goes on. And what the bride wanted was the cake, the wedding cake, which was three, I think it was a three-tier cake. She wanted the cake to be in the middle of the dance floor so that everybody can see. Okay? So... Cool. So beforehand, I got there. I saw the cake. Everything's fine. I'm, 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 I'm on board. Then the caterer comes to me and whispers in my ear, the cake's falling down. I'm like, what? <laughs> I said, the bride wants this cake to be on the dance floor. I don't care what you do. I want that cake on the dance floor. So they kind of saw my face, and they were trying to do something, and I saw they were trying to make it happen. And as carefully as possible, they brought it to the dance floor, and that cake was just leaning. And it just made it in time for them to cut that cake. So we know that when it comes to the wedding day, there's a lot of pressure, and there's a lot of things to be done. But when you compare the wedding day of in, 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 in the natural sense compared to the wedding feast that's coming for us as Christians, it's very different. The celebration that we're going to experience 
as it's described in Revelation chapter 19, is very different to what we think it's going to be like. In fact, the focus is not so much on the bride, but the focus is on the bridegroom. And this morning, this is what we're going to look at as the church, as the bride. So Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, reading from verse 6. I hope you have your Bibles with you and turn with me there. For some of you, you might have a title above there that says, The Married Supper of the Lamb. Verse 6 says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder crying out. Now this is John. This is the revelation of John. And this is what he says that he's hearing. And the voices that he's hearing, this is what it says, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! How many of you have an exclamation mark there? Do you have an exclamation mark? Okay. It says, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Do you notice that it doesn't say the marriage of the bride? It says the marriage of the the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Verse eight, it was granted her a, to clothe herself with the fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thank God for his word this morning. When we look at what John's been exposed to, the background to the whole book of Revelation is that John is banished to the island of Patmos. And the Holy Spirit is giving him this vision. And he's having this engagement with the Holy Spirit that's giving him the revelation of the future. But we see that Revelation actually is not that complicated because it highlights of the church being ready to to meet the bridegroom. So we see in the beginning of the book of Revelation, there's a a message to the elders of the different churches. And there's a reminder to the churches that you need to get your house into order because the bridegroom is coming and I'm just summing that up. And there's many, there's different imageries and and different ideas and, and different things of how we can unpack Revelation and we look at the dragon and we look at the lion and we look at the lamb and, and all different things. But specifically here, when we look at John Looking at Revelation 19, he's introducing us to this marriage feast that's coming. Now, some of you joke, well, I joke, that I'm hoping that at that marriage feast, there will be bacon. Because bacon's very nice. But the, the serious part of it is that for us as the bride... When we look at scriptures in 2 Corinthians and Ephesians, we see that the bride is the church. Paul highlights that and makes a very strong statement about that, that the bride is the church. And in all seriousness, when we look at this feast, and as John says, are we going to be found there? That's the question that I ask you and I challenge you this morning. Will you be found at that marriage feast? Now let's look at the bridegroom. At the wedding, or at a wedding, we see that even for the Jews, it was customary to focus on the bride, even amongst the Jewish people. But John flips it on his head and and, and shows that the focus needs to be on Jesus Christ. The bridegroom. And when we look at what the bridegroom has done for us, that before the very foundations of the earth, the bridegroom, the Lamb of God, has chosen his bride. Before the foundations of the earth. It's kind of like an arranged marriage type thing. 
but He has chosen us before the very foundations of the earth. So I want to share with you this morning that the bridegroom has chosen you. You didn't choose Him. You did not choose Him. And it's very hard to comprehend and understand this, that the bridegroom, in spite of the bride being tainted with spots and blemish, and and besides the fact that the bride is not perfect, he still chooses you because the Bible teaches us that the bridegroom, the Lamb of God, came and died for sinners. Now, maybe in God's eyes, because of sin, We are the ugliest looking bride ever. I promise you, not even makeup will be able to do justice. Not even plastic surgery will be able to do justice for the church when we look at the sinfulness of the bride. But in spite of all of that, the bridegroom chose you and chose me. While we were yet still sinners, while that mess and that ugliness was on us, he still chose us. He went to that cross for you and for me. I want you to imagine and picture that, that the bridegroom, the moment in the the garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus knew what was going to happen, not so much about the whooping and what he was going to go through, but it was about the sin that was going to be laid on his shoulders. Do you remember that story? And we're going to celebrate it in Easter, that the sin that was upon him was the sin of millions of people around the world and that God couldn't even face him. His father couldn't even face him. Where Jesus says on the cross, why have you forsaken me? And God takes away the sin of the world. He takes away that ugliness of the bride to make us pure and perfect and whiter than snow, that when the bridegroom comes back, he's looking for a bride that is without without spot and without blemish. And this is it. This is what Jesus Christ does for you and for me. The bridegroom chose you. This morning, if you are feeling lonely, if you're feeling depressed, I want to tell you that Jesus chose you. Jesus chose you. If you've been neglected by your parents, if you've been neglected by people, if ugly and nasty things have been said to you, I want to tell you that the King of Kings chose you. You didn't have to choose Him. He chose you. When we look at the Jewish weddings in that day, they were kind of unlike the weddings that we have in the Western world. So we see that there was an engagement that took place. And we see that parents were very much a part of that. But what they did with the engagement was that it was actually considered to be a marriage. And they would be engaged for a year. But the bridegroom would go away back to his parents' house. And for a year, the bride would stay with her parents. And in this time, we find that the bride needed to be faithful because there was a covenant that was made that I am betrothed to get married to that man. And in that time, she needed to remain faithful because she was already chosen. For us as a church, on the whole, we've been chosen. And in this time of engagement, because Jesus has left us, and we are waiting for the bridegroom to come and fetch us, we need to remain faithful. We need to be living a life that pleases the Father. Because we have been chosen. So we see that God the Father is very serious about his relationship with his people. For centuries he continues to pursue us. And finally culminating in the act of love. From the book of Genesis, we see that God continues to pursue us. For those of us that have been around church for a long time and we've been reading the Old Testament, how many times did the Israel, the the Jewish nation disappoint God? How many times? The covenant that he makes with Adam and Eve in the garden is don't eat of the fruit. The covenant that he makes with them and this, this relationship that he has with them, don't eat the fruit. And then they go and do it. And at that moment, he could have destroyed them, but he shows them grace. 
He shows them grace. So the amount of times that we disappoint God for some reason because of his love, and it's a mystery, and I can't explain it, he continues to pursue us. He continues to pursue us. This morning, I want you to take stock of your life and think about the amount of times that you've run away from God. Think about the amount of times for you as a bride in the terms of our relationship with Jesus that you had an affair. Think about the amount of times that you committed adultery. Think about the amount of times that you failed God in your relationship with him. Think about the amount of times where he's made a covenant with us and he says, do not steal, do not lie, do not do all these things. Make sure that I'm your God. How many times have you failed God in that way? Yet as a pure bride, we were supposed to be in waiting for the bridegroom to come. And the life that we live here on earth is supposed to be pure and holy and pleasing because you know why? We represent Jesus. We carry his name. So when we say that we are Christian, there's an identity attached to that, that you belong to the King of Kings. And there's a certain way that we need to act and we need to behave. It's quiet here in the room. But if we take stock of our lives, how many times have we failed God? But the cool thing about the bridegroom leaving us, he was sitting with his disciples in John chapter 14, and he was saying to them, look, there's going to be a time where I'm going to leave. And the disciples were afraid, and, and they were <sighs> upset with the fact that the rabbi was going to leave. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. For in my Father's house, there are many rooms. So this morning, no matter how many times you have failed God, there's grace at the foot of the cross. There is salvation and forgiveness at the foot of the cross. No matter who you are this morning, if you haven't accepted Christ as your personal Savior, Jesus says there are many rooms in my Father's mansion, and it's including you. There's a place for you. There's a place for you. God is making a place for you. And when it comes to the Jewish marriage feast and the marriage supper and all of this, this type of thing, the bridegroom goes away for a year and he comes back because he's prepared a space for his bride. What did Jesus say? I'm going away to prepare a space for you and I'm coming back for you. There's coming a day where he's coming back for his church, for his bride, and that includes you and it includes me. So number two, when we look at the marriage feast, it includes the bride. And this is the expectation that God puts on us, that Jesus puts on us as the bride. He requires faithfulness. He requires faithfulness. And you know what faithfulness looks like? Obedience. Obedience. God is a mystery. I, don't, I, don't, I can't explain certain things, but in the book of Isaiah, he uses the prophet to demonstrate of how much he loves his people. And when you analyze and you think about your life of how bad you think you might be, God's grace is sufficient for us. The prophet Isaiah is instructed to go and marry a prostitute. And to have children, and when you look in chapter 1 of the children's names, it actually identifies of, it's, not, it's names you wouldn't want to name your children. And God uses that marriage to show that even though you married her, Hosea married her, you know what the woman go, does? She goes back into prostitution and she commits adultery. And then chapter 3 of Hosea, God says, go back and fetch her. Go back and fetch her. That even though she's with many other men, even though she's committed adultery in the same way, that even though the Jewish people, the, the, the nation that's chosen, even though they've failed me and they've been worshiping the gods of Baal, I'm coming back for them. Because I love them so much. That's the grace of God. As a bride, we can't understand this, but coming to Easter, we need to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ died for you and I, and there is grace and forgiveness at the cross. And as a bride, the amount of times that we commit adultery, the amount of times that we fail God, the idols that we have in our life. If you don't know what an idol is, 
the thing that takes the place of God in your life. You know those moments when you say, I don't have time to pray? What's taken the place of that? Is it your binge watching on Netflix? So yesterday we were at, um, at a Sunday school conference and I, and I was one of the speakers there. And uh, the one session that I attended, the lady hit this really hard of how it's affecting our kids. And not only affecting our kids, it's affecting us as adults. We might think that technology today is actually better for us, but it's not. We live in a soundbite society. That's why it's difficult to sit and listen to a sermon that's longer than 20 minutes. Because all we want is a soundbite. Am I right? Instagram, how long is the clip? 30 seconds? How long is your status with the video? 30 seconds. On YouTube, you look for a video that's about a minute and a minute and a half. But other than that, all you do is with your thumb. It's hard to do advertising. You have to be very strategic when you advertise, especially on social media, because people are doing this. And that's what our Christian life has become. What do I mean by that? This has become the idol in your life. Think about it. How much time do we spend scrolling through Facebook when there could be a moment with the Lord? Think about it. So a few years ago, and I made mention, uh, reminded my wife of this, there was, uh, we were sitting in a restaurant, and, um, and opposite us, there was a mom and a daughter. And as soon as the mom sat down, for some reason, she was in my eye shot, and I, I noticed that she took out her cell phone. And from the time we placed an order till the time we got our food, that lady was on her phone. The daughter sitting across the table from a, a little girl, sweetest little thing, and she was trying to find something to do because mom wasn't paying attention to her. And it was frustrating me to the point where my wife put, my, put her hand on my leg and said, don't do it. Because I felt sorry for the child. Because the child was looking for attention. You know what happened? They ordered drinks and the drinks came. The mom took the phone, took a selfie together with the daughter, with the drinks, went back on her phone. You know what the child did for attention? The mom didn't even see it. She took her iced tea and she poured it on the table. She took a finger and then she started playing with the iced tea on the table. Her mom didn't even see that happen. What's the idol in your life? Is it hitting home? The bride of Christ, of who we are, is faithfulness and obedience. It is the idols that we have in our life that has replaced God and this is why it's hard to maintain and, and, and to fulfill the covenant relationship that we have with God. So you know what we find? As a, being married to God, there's a lot of dishonesty. And because of the love that Jesus has for us, this is why he says in the book of Malachi, I hate divorce because the love that he has for us is the love that we can't explain. It's sacrificial love. That's why he hates divorce. Because of the love that he has for you and I. But the one way to satisfy this, the one way to satisfy this is to identify the love language of Jesus. Do you know what the love language of Jesus is? Okay, let me give you a quick lesson of what the love language is. Now, Gary Chapman, um, he's well known for the five love languages. For some of you that have heard of it, you would know that what the five love languages are. The one is physical touch, okay? The one is words of affirmation, acts of service, gifts, quality time. Some of you can identify with that, right? And when those um, uh, love gifts are basically satisfied, you find that your love tank is satisfied. So for me, it's... I'm not going to tell you what my love language is. <laughs> when it comes to Jesus, he tells us in the book of John that his love language is obedience. He says, if you love me, obey my commands. Obedience. 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 This is what we need to do, is to obey. So when we look at in the beginning when I spoke about the price and how much a wedding costs, the price that was paid for you and I to be seated at that marriage feast was higher than, than what we can think of. There's a hymn that we, that we sing that was written in 1865 
there was a lady that was sitting in the service and the pastor was preaching, but she wasn't paying attention so much of the whole content, but there was bits and pieces she was taking away from it. And as the pastor was preaching, she started to write a poem down. And straight after the service, she goes and apologizes to the pastor and says, look, I was paying attention, but I wasn't. <laughs> but this is the poem that I, that, that I wrote down. And he looked at the words and he was like, wow, th- this is amazing. Uh, it actually ties in with, with, with our organist that also wrote some words down. And this was the hymn that, that came about from that session. And the words you would know well is, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. That's it. The cost has been paid for you as a bride. You have been chosen. He has paid it all. So all that we owe to him is our obedience to the Father. Is our obedience to Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to encourage you. Do you acknowledge that Jesus Christ died for you? Do you acknowledge that his blood was shed for you? Do you acknowledge that on the third day he rose again? And by conquering death, he gives us hope and a future? Because this morning, if you acknowledge that, we are going to share in communion. And I'm going to ask those that are serving with me. We're going to share in communion. And I want you to think about that when you're holding that bread and when you are holding that grape juice, that the price has been paid, that you are his bride, and Jesus paid it all. Can we close our eyes and bow our heads? Can the worship team come up? Father, we come before you this morning. Father, I pray that even as we as we sit in this quietness, the expectation, Lord, is for the bride to be without spot and without blemish. God, we know that we'll only reach perfection, perfection once we see you. Once glorification takes place, that's perfection. But Lord, while we yearn earth, your expectation is obedience. I pray this morning that even as we come before you around the table, Lord, as we acknowledge the blood, as we acknowledge the body that was broken for us, I pray, Father, there'll be a heart of thankfulness. And Lord, that if we have failed you, there'll be a heart of forgiveness and repentance. So this morning, Father, we worship you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, in all God's people say, 